بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا أبو إمامنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تمسك بهديه ودعا بدعوته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته etiquettes or the etiquette of the disciple manners of the disciple from the jami' of al-khatib al-khatib al-baghdadi rahimahullah as you all know was one of the greatest hadith scholars that lived especially of his time being from the ulama of the fifth century of the hijra the fifth century and he was called Hafid al Mashriq. He was the Hadith master of the East. And he wrote many great books on the sciences of Hadith. Rather, there isn't a subgenre or subfield of Hadith except that he has a book on it. And from what he wrote on was pertaining to the do's and the don'ts for people who have the desire to learn the sunnah, people who have the desire to study it and to practice it, to learn it, to teach it, to obtain it. But it has to be a way. It can't just be haphazard. It can't be done how you want it. But it has to be cultivated and it has to be guided. It has to be cultivated and it has to be guided. So he wrote a few books pertaining to some of the do's and some of the don'ts for people who have the fever to learn hadith. But having fever and passion isn't enough. That's not enough. But you have to be educated and enlightened and know the proper way and the improper way. Learn that which is proper to try your best to do it. And learn that which is improper to try your best and to strive to avoid it. So this is, or this is one of the reasons why he wrote this book called Al Jami' لِأَخْلَاقِ الرَّابِي وَأَدَابِ السَّامِعِ الجامع. He wrote a comprehensive book, a compilation of prophetic hadiths, athar mankufa, wise statements and proverbs of the tabi'een and those who came after the tabi'een, lines of poetry that pertain to لِأَخْلَاقِ الرَّابِي The narrative of hadith, his mode of conduct, وَأَدَابِ السَّامِعِ for disciples of hadith. Now, due to the fact that he lived in the fifth century, and we're gonna find some of the things that he talks about, and some of the things that he speaks on in his book, you'll find it very strange and very interesting and in how we live in 2018. And you'll find many parallels, many consistencies. And you may say as if Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi rahimahullah wrote this book for us here in Toronto. But he lived about or approximately a thousand years ago in a whole different cultural atmosphere, political atmosphere, religious atmosphere. So this goes to show that uh, there's always been or there's always, there always been these types of problems among people who attribute themselves to knowledge and people who attribute themselves to hadith. So this isn't something which is new. And when you notice, alhamdulillah, it makes things easy on yourself. And you don't become as stressed and as worried and as depressed when you realize that some of these problems have been existing for what? For a very long time. It's not just new. It's not just us. Huh? And it also goes to show you if those great ulama of the past achieved what they achieved despite their troubles and their adversities, the challenges and the roadblocks, then perhaps we can what? Achieve something similar to that. That which is suitable for our situation. Everybody understand this? Khayr, inshallah, that's first and foremost. So he wrote his book called Al Jami' li Akhlaq al Rawi wa Dab al Sami'. And then Al Khatib al Baghdad, he wrote other books pertaining to the do's and the don'ts of people who wish to seek hadith, such as Sharafu Ashab al Hadith. Sharafu Ashab al Hadith. He wrote a book about the nobility and the honor of the disciples of hadith. And not like the Madhabi people say, and Ahl Kalam, and the people of the Madrasa al Aqlaniya, so on and so forth. What they said about the people of Athar and Hadith. They're just dumb and stupid and zawamil. They're just beasts of burden. They carry narrations. They have no fiqh, no faham, no understanding. Huh? 
it's outdated, it's prehistoric. It goes to show you how old that claim is. That if you're just a literalist, you're a Zahiri, if you're not a blind follower. If you don't follow Madhab Shafi'i and blind follower, then they automatically classify you as a Zahiri. You're literalists. You have no fiqh, no fahm. You just memorize some things and that's it. If you don't follow Abu Hanifa, then you don't understand how to apply modern day fiqh. If you don't listen to this sheikh or this scholar, so on and so forth. Why study hadith? Well, why? There were teachers in the Islamic University of Medina, the Katira, doctors who discouraged me from going to hadith. And the master's program says, don't go to hadith. Why go to hadith? They would say this. They say, your country can't benefit from hadith. Well, why? I'm not making this up. Some of them would say this. They say, your country, your people can't benefit from hadith. They say, you need to go to sharia. You need to go to dawah. No need of you studying and specializing in hadith. Your people aren't ready for that. Well, like some of them will say this. So you realize that it isn't a what? A new thing. It's an old thing of people being short-sighted and narrow-minded. What could be more beneficial for my country than me having an expertise in what the Prophet said, did, and allowed? What could my people need more than that? Billahi alayki ya shaykh. What do my people need more than Muhammad Sallallahu way? What could they need more? This is a very unfortunate thing. You read all different types of statements, derogatory stories, and things like this that were said against the people of Hadith. So he wrote a book called Sharafu Ashab al Hadith. And he also wrote another book called Nasihati li Ahl al Hadith, Awli Ashab al Hadith. Once more, Lam Maha, he saw khalal, more mistakes, more errors. Young men not behaving themselves how they're supposed to behave themselves with regards to seeking Hadith. And he wrote a book advising them. And from the most important things that he spoke about in that book was seeking knowledge in your youthful years. Hmm? Seeking knowledge when you're young. Not when you're old, not after you finish medical school and law school and not get married. Seek knowledge when you're young. Then you can do other things later on. But you can't seek knowledge the same way huh? when you have a young, elastic, spongy type of mind. It isn't the what? It's not the same. And he also wrote another book called Iqtida Al-Ilm Al-Amal. He wrote a book in which he warned the people from learning things and not implementing those things. The requirement of knowledge is action. And he also wrote another book called Al-Faqih wal Mutafaqih, in which he spoke on the etiquettes of fatwa, the etiquettes of mufti, the etiquettes of ijtihad, of taqlid, of qiyas, etc. So he has a very long lineage pertaining to these types of books. So, a modern day scholar, he came along and he summarized the book. He summarized it and he condensed it. And that scholar was Sheikh Bakr Abu Zayd, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the famous author of Hilyat Talib al Ilm, The Adornment of the Student of Knowledge, famous book in Arabic and in English. He came along and he made a muntaqa. He made a muntaqa, yani tahdib, mukhtasar. He summarized it and he condensed it in which he took everything and he huh, squoze it into one cup, keeping it summarized and condensed and not in a lengthy, long, drawn out, how voluminous work. So that is what the work that we have here today. Al-Muntaqa min Jami' al-Khatib. So the original book is Al-Jami' li akhlaq al-Rawi wa adab al-Sami' which has been edited and annotated into two volumes. The book is in widespread circulation. Anyone can find it. You can buy the book, you can get the PDF. And also, which has been uh, in widespread circulation, but not as popular as the book of Sheikh Bakr, rahimahullah, which is an excellent book, and I would advise all the talab al ha, and yaqra'uha. When you deem one nadr fi, hmm, aw fiha. Al Muhim. So that's the book that we're going to deal with, bin the night, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anyone who wishes to go back to the original source, he can do so at your own leisure, at your own time, inshallah ta'ala. What we'll be reading, or what we will be reading, bin the night, ta'ala, is the Mukhtasar. Okay, so with that being said, the introduction, uh, Sheikh Bakr rahimahullah says, Al Muntaqa min Muqaddamat al Jami' li Akhlaq al Rawi wa Adab al Sami'. Alhamdulillahi dil Qudrati wal Jalal. Wa Ni'im al Sabirati wal Ifdal. Al Adi Manna alayna bi Ma'rifati wa Hadana ila al Iqrari bi Rububiyatih. Wa Jalana min Ummatin Khatim al Nabiyin. Al Sami bi Fadli ala Sayyid al Alameen. Al Tahir al Araq. Al Sharif al Akhlaq. الذي قال الله الكريم مخاطبا له في الذكر الحكيم وإنك لا على خلق عظيم 
صلى الله عليه وسلم وأزلف منزلته لديه وعلى إخوانه وأقربيه وصحابته الأخيار وتابعيه وسلم عليه وعليه مجمعين دائما أبدا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد ذكرت في كتاب شرف أصحاب الحديث ما يحدو ذا الهمة على تتبع أثار رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والاجتهاد في طلبها والحرص على سماعها والاهتمام بجمعها والانتساب إليها ولكل علم طريقة ينبغي لأهله أن يسلكوها وآلات يجب عليهم أن يأخذوا بها ويستعملوها وقد رأيت خلقا من أهل هذا الزمان ينتسبون إلى الحديث ويعدون أنفسهم من أهله على المتخصصين بسماعه ونقله وهم أبعد الناس مما يدعون وأقلهم معرفة بما إليه ينتسبون يرى الواحد منهم إذا كتب عددا قليلا من الأجزاء واشتغل بالسماع برهة يسيرة من الدهر أنه صاحب حديث على الإطلاق ولما يجهد نفسه ويتعبها في طلابه ولا لحقته مشقة الحفظ لسنوفه وأبوابه So the author he begins his khutbah <coughs> in a classic style that many of the ulama would open up their books they would start off, we said earlier, with rhythmic melody. They would rhyme. They would use saja. And we know in the deen, it's permissible to rhyme. It's permissible to rhyme. It's permissible to rhyme whether it's in speaking or even if it's in a dua, as long as the ulama says, biduni takalluf, in which you're not going too hard, too extreme, trying too hard to make it rhyme and to make it sound good as if you're selling the dua to the people. As we see in Ramadan, we see in the Qunut al-Witr, every dua has to be 30 minutes, and every single line has to rhyme, and has to be spell, spellbounding, huh? And it breaks the people's hearts, they cry, <gasps> SubhanAllah, and he's rhyming and rhyming, and then the one who's making the dua, or on the khutbah, he starts crying, but he keeps rhyming. How are you heartbroken, emotionally distraught, but you keep what? Something's what? Something's seriously wrong, Mahdi. Everybody clearing this or not? But it's permissible to say something that has a rhythmic tone as long as it isn't something which is what? Be tekelluf, too extreme. Everybody clearing this or not? So we see here that Al Khatib, he starts off what? Where's the first rhyme? He says, Dil Qudrati wal Jalal. Ah, Samir. He says, Wal Ni'am al Sabira. Well, ifdal, that's a rhyme. Huh? Jalal and ifdal does what? They what? Don't be scared to say it, Ikhwan. It's a permissible type of rhyme, inshallah. It's a type of what? It's a rhyme, it rhymes. Tayyip? He says, Alladhi manna alayna bi ma'rifatihi wa hadana ila al iqrari bi rububiyyatihi. It does what? Rhymes once more. Look at the title of the book Al Jami'. لأخلاق الراوي وأداب السامع رامز فتح الباري بشرح نيل الأوتار شرح منتقى الأخبار وعلى هذا فقس ها تهذيب التهذيب the ulama of the past they would write the title which would be rhythmic and it would rhyme and it would also be symbolic and synonymous with the actual title of the book فتح الباري بشرح صحيح البخار D. Everybody with me or not? Everybody with me? You guys with me or not? Al Jami'. Rhymes with what word? Sami'. You got me or not? Everybody with me? Khairan, inshallah. So he starts off his khutbah by rhyming. And Al Khatib, rahimahullah, even though he was a hadith scholar, he was also a very strong linguist. Huh? He, was, he had very strong penmanship. Khairan, inshallah. So after he starts off with his introduction, praising Allah Azza wa for the guidance of our Islam, he was blessed us and given us so much, and he who has allowed us to know him and to worship him and to make us from the Ummah of Muhammad والسلام, the last of the prophets and messengers. And he speaks on the virtue of Muhammad and his high exalted standard of character, asking Allah to send prayers and salutations upon his family, his companions, etc. He says, Amma ba'd. The previous book that I wrote, which is called Sharaf Ashab al Hadith, as I just explained to you, and this goes to show you that many of the ulama have the past, is nothing wrong with them mentioning some of their works. That doesn't. 
او التكبر او المفاخره لا it doesn't mean it's showing off or boasting or bragging but someone has wrote a book they they wrote a book it's a beneficial book he knows the work and the effort that he put into the book it's nothing wrong with him mentioning it i've i've spoken on this in this book we talked about it in this video there's nothing wrong with that and referring back to your own works huh so he says, we previously wrote a book which is called Sharafu Ashab al Hadith. He says, in this book, he says, Ma Yahdu. Huh? It's like when you're driving camels. Anyone who's ever driven camels, you have a staff, a cane, and the Arabs, the Bedouin people, some people may know about camels, you actually sing to the camels as well. You push the camels. Everybody understand this? Al Al Huda. Everybody understand this? You get the camels to what? To move. He says, we previously explained in this book, Sharaf al Sahab al Hadith, he says, Ma yahdu dal himma, is that which pushes and encourages and incites people to have high aspirations, he shan. He wrote, the, he wrote that book, The Nobility of the People of Hadith, to encourage you to seek the Sunnah, to learn the Sunnah. Huh? To encourage you to do what? To learn the Sunnah. He says here, to hear it, to listen to it, to gather it. He says, Walintisabi ilayha. And to attribute yourself what? To it. To attribute yourself to hadith and to sunnah. He then says, listen to this golden rule. This is a qaida here. He says, And every discipline, every field, every level or type of expertise has a mode and a method that the people should abide or abide by and adhere to. The people of the Quran tariqah that they have and they abide by that tariqah the people of fiqh the people of fatwa there's a specific mode of behavior and conduct that they have and they should stick to it and abide by it and the people of hadith as well they what? there is a mode there's a mode of conduct a manner of behavior that you have to abide by now he says here talking about the problem that he has in his town he says, وَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ خَلْقًا مِنْ أَهْلِ هَذَا الزَّمَانِ He says, as far as the people of our times, then I've seen many of them attributing themselves to hadith, calling themselves disciples of hadith, students of hadith, ashab al-hadith, those who specialize in hadith, who hear it, who spread it. He says, and they're the furthest of the people from what they claim. They set it upon the way of the sunnah, kitab, sunnah, the way of the salaf al-salih. He says, وَهُمَ أَبْعَدَ النَّاسِ they are from the what? Most remote of what they actually what? Say with their tongues. He says, and they have the least knowledge of that which they claim and call themselves. The least of knowledge. He says, one person, he sits down for a short period of time. He writes a couple of memorandums of hadith. He listens for a little bit, and then he considers himself to be an absolute hadith master. And he's barely studied. He barely has enough under his belt. He says here, this person, he hasn't exhausted himself in seeking hadith, nor has he suffered lahiqatu mashaka. He says, nor has he tasted the hardships of reading, studying, traveling, and compiling hadiths. So this is why he wrote the what? Why he wrote the book, because of a problem, a phenomena. And there were people that would attribute themselves to something, but they were actually void of that thing. Kasiatun. Ariat. They were dressed, but at the same time, what? Undressed. Undressed. Everybody understand this? Kasiatun Ariat. They have on the clothing, they have on the tarbush, the jubba, huh? The, the mantle, the robe, the cloak, huh? But deep down inside is what? Nothing. It's just a game. It's just a, for show. Everybody clear on this or not? So this is very dangerous, huh? Khayran, inshallah. So that is why he wrote the book. And that's the summary of it. He says here, he says, and even though they have just a little bit of knowledge, and they're barely writing it down, they're barely recording it, they're not really putting in, they haven't put in enough work yet. You're barely scratching the surface. 
You're barely on the surface of the pond. Despite that, as a, that's more than enough as a problem. He says they have a great deal of pride. Right? He says they have the greatest pride. They're stuck up. They're conceited. He says, and they have a great deal of tea. They're just lost and bewildered. Maghrurin. They're full of themselves. They can only see at the tip of their noses. And they can't see tomorrow, next week, next month, the next years. They can't see anything. They're just stuck in the moment. And he says they have a ujb. The only thing that they see and realize is themselves. Hmm? He says here they have no respect for a teacher. They have no respect or loyalty for a student. He says they look down upon us, the narrators. They're violent and harsh upon the learners. And this is exact or exactly opposite to what they have heard, meaning the hadiths are supposed to have an effect upon your character. How can you be arrogant? How can you be harsh? How can you be this? How can you have no respect? And you're sitting there and you're reading Sayyid al-Bukhari all day. Something isn't right. You're supposed to have the softest heart. You're supposed to have the best akhlaq. You're supposed to be the kindest, sweetest, most patient person because you're hearing the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu all day, every day. Are you understanding this? So just stop and think about yourselves. Let all of us think about ourselves, our tempers, huh? our anger problems, our attitude problems. Let us think about how we treat our parents, our teachers, our students, how quick we lose our temper. Or if you look at the Dawah scene today, look how fast a person divorces a sheikh. His sheikh al Islam comes to Canada, he comes to the Marquez, the center, everyone benefits from him. It's a Q&A session to 2 a.m. at night. You eat, huh? Dinner, eat breakfast with the sheikh Nam, and then the sheikh he says this statement, or he goes against another sheikh, or his ijtihad, or sheikh Fulan, and then that person is done now what? It's not like a what? A hot plate. Worn from him, burn his stuff, get rid of his stuff. He's a kalb, he's this, he's that, shaitan, kathabun ashir. He's a dajjal. But just yesterday, this person was your sheikh that taught you, that nurtured you, that was teaching you the basic fundamentals of Islam. Look here, they have no respect for a teacher. Even if he went astray, or he said some things, he is still your what? Man alamani harfan kuntu Huh? Wahakiba tayyib. So this is a major problem here that a khatib is talking about. He says, Well wajibu and yukuna talabutu al hadithi akman and nasi adabin, wa ashad al khalki tawaduan, wa adamahum nazahatan wa tadayunan, wa kalahum taishan wa ghadaban. لِدَوَامِ قَرْعِ أَسْمَاعِهِمْ بِالْأَخْبَارِ الْمُشْتَمِلَةِ عَلَى مَحَاسِنِ أَخْلَاقِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَأَدَابِهِ وَسِيرَةِ السَّلَفِ الْأَخْيَارِ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ وَأَصْحَابِهِ وَطْرَاقِ الْمُهَدِّثِينَ وَمَعَاثِرِ الْمَاضِينَ فَيَأْخُذُوا بِأَجْمَلِهَا وَأَحْسَنِهَا وَيَصْطِفُوا عَنْ أَرْذَلِهَا وَأَدْوَنِهَا He says, and now which is mandatory, there's another golden rule, a golden quote. He says, the students of hadith have to have the most perfect character. Not good character, not polished character, but if you're attributing yourself to hadith, you're supposed to have the what? The best adab. He says you're supposed to have the greatest amount of humility and humbleness, and you're supposed to be the cleanest and the furthest from any type of doubtful situation. Any type of what? Doubtful situation. Everybody understand this? He says here, and they are supposed to be those who are the most forbearant and the furthest from recklessness. Someone being Ta'ish, who's all over the place and reckless. Someone who has a major anger problem, who loses his temper, huh? And snaps out. And let alone someone who fulfills their rage in the name of the deen. I don't like you, you've upset me, you've angered me. I'm gonna now take it out on you, but in the name of the what? of the religion. Everybody understand this? You will be sacrificed in the name of the what? The deen, because of my rage. That's even worse now. He says here, and this is because, he says, asma'ihim. He says, the ears are constantly being banged. It's clamor. The hadith is supposed to be banging and clashing on their what? On their ears. Everybody understand this? It's supposed to hit you. As they say, it's supposed to what? It's supposed to hit you. He says, the akhlaq of the Prophet Sallallahu the best of the best. And also the life of the Salaf al-Salih from Ahlul Bayt and from the Sahaba. 
and the scholars of hadith of the past, what they did, what they sacrificed. So a person is supposed to take the best of this and to avoid the worst character. And I remember specifically بتوفيق الله سبيلهم هكذا مضبوط ونسأل الله المعونة على ما يرضى والعصمة من اتباع الباطل والهوى you see he continued to what? <laughs> the rhyme طيب so he says this is why I wrote this book in order for the people to learn what is correct and to do it and to avoid which is ugly and base and to stay away from that and to learn from the previous scholars of hadith what they did, how they traveled how they wrote hadiths how they implemented the hadiths and how they behaved with the teacher, with the student, someone who was above, someone who was beneath, someone who was astray, someone, however, the, how they dealt with the people, the proper behavior of the disciple. Have I turned this? Khairan, insha'Allah. Now we have, he says, Al Muntaqa min Tarajimihi wa Aqwalihi, the summary of some of the chapters. Inshallah, our volunteer to read. Any volunteer? Bismillah. Khastuhu. Tayyib. It says here, the first point is the intention for seeking hadith. The intention. And the intention has two meanings. The first is ikhlas, and the second is proper intent. And they aren't the same. You can be sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm studying for Allah's sake. But it doesn't mean you have the proper intention and the proper purpose. I'm studying hadith for the sake of Allah, but I don't want to teach any classes. No, I'm only doing this for myself. I'm not that guy, you say, I'm not what? I'm not that guy, I don't want to be in the spotlight. I don't want to be in front of the brothers or the sisters. I don't want to get refuted. I don't have the patience for people to talk about me and spread gospel, I'm, no, I can't deal with that. So I'm going to keep studying, keep it only for my what? For myself. He's doing it sincerely for who? For Allah, but his purpose is what? is incorrect. You can't just study, study, learn, 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 and only want to keep it to yourself. Everybody turn this or not? Or a person may say, <coughs> I'm not here to change anything. I'm not here to make a difference. I'm not here to save the world. I don't know all the problems. I'm just here to do a couple of classes, give me my imam's check, I want to get paid, my honorarium, and then that's it, kalas. The other mashakin and the problems, I can't help you. Please don't call me, Aki. Don't email me. Don't WhatsApp me. Don't ask me no personal questions. I came, I did my lecture, I gave my talk, and that's it. Now that I'm back on my plane, I'm, no, 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 no. His purpose is also what? Incorrect. Your honorarium or your paycheck that you get from being a teacher or a resident scholar, that's considered to be the what? That's the footnote. That's the sideshow. This is nothing more than a measly compensation. But the true reason behind you being an imam or a scholar is supposed to be what? For the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously you have to pay rent or your house, you have to have gas, food, your children need pampers, things like that. Necessities of life. No one works absolutely for free. And the knowledge that comes to you which is absolutely free in most cases is never good. It's not good, that which comes absolutely for free. Or that which is extremely cheap. Many people, they get upset. What did he say, Abu Sayyid? He said, a brother charges. Uh, 
to get something that's high quality doesn't come what? Doesn't come easily, doesn't come for cheap. No, it doesn't work like that, not in life. You want something that's mediocre, something that's mashy hot, okay, no problem. But something that's high quality and refined is going to come with some type of what? Some type of price. For a person to free himself and to devote himself to his chosen art, how's he going to do that outside if, his, if his, his belly is hungry, if he's growling? Huh? If he's thirsty, he has no tea to drink, he can't study. Huh? This is a reality. So the point is, is what? Is that for a person to think that I'm in it just to make money, I'm in it because it's a job, it's occupation, his purpose is also what? It's incorrect. But he's not studying for the dunya. He's studying for the face of Allah. But his intention of I'm supposed to be here to help the people out, to give voluntary things, to talk after the lecture, before the lecture. You have a question? Marhaba, let's sit, let's talk. If you think they're going to be free from all of that, your purpose is also incorrect. Everybody understand this? You're supposed to be a guide, a guiding light to the people. A guiding light to the people. You're supposed to help people. You're supposed to change people's lives by Allah's permission. Everybody understand this? So one is al-ikhlas, and the second is the proper application of your intention and your purpose. Everybody clear this or not? And they aren't synonymous. They're two different things. You mean Mahdi? Tayyip. He says a talib al-hadith has to make his intention sincere. And his intention must be the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has to be wary of making his search of hadith to obtain worldly material gain. Because it's a severe threat for those who do this. I want to seek knowledge to get money. I want to seek knowledge to get status. I want to seek knowledge so I can marry a beautiful, charming wife. I want to seek knowledge so I can get a handsome, charming husband. I want to seek knowledge so I can have status and position because I'm a lowly person. I don't have a lot of friends. I don't have a lot of associates. I want to have power. I want to have control. So on and so on and so on and so forth. Any type of worldly gain and material gain is not to be your intention in seeking ilm. He says, وَلْيَتَّقِ الْمُفَاخَرَةَ وَالْمُبَاهَةَ بِهِ وَنِكُونَ قَصْلُهُ فِي طَلْبِ الْحَدِيثِ نَيْلَ الْرِيَاسَةَ وَاتِخَاذِ الْأَتْبَاعَ وَأَقْتِ الْمَجَالِسِ فإن الآفة الداخلة على العلماء أكثرها من هذا الوجه. He says, beware of showing off, beware of boasting and bragging. He says, and beware of seeking leadership, and having followers and stoops and lackeys. Beware of just a person being the center of the majlis. He says, because this here is the main reason why the ulama go astray. This is the main cancer right here of ulama. This type of power thirst, this thirst for power, this greed for status. And it creeps up on you subtly. And before you know it, just like a cancer, it does what? It becomes very aggressive. And it takes over other parts of your body. And you may not even realize that this is your intention anymore. So we have to be mindful of this. فإن رواة العلوم كثير ورعاتها قليل ورب حاضر كالغائب وعالم كالجاهل وحامل الحديث ليس معه منه شيء إذ كان في اطراحه لحكمه بمنزلة الذهب عن معرفة وعلم. He says when you memorize something, don't just memorize it just for the factual information. He says but memorize that thing to look after it, to review it, and to implement it. To review it and to implement it and to understand it properly. Knowledge versus wisdom. Having wisdom, but a person being foolish when it comes to implementing that wisdom. He says, because people who bear knowledge, they're abundant. There are many people who memorize things, who know things. Listen to this. He says, someone who's present may be actually what? Ghaib. He may be what? Absent, as if he's not even here. His mind is in a different place. He says someone who is an alim may actually be what? Jahl, he's ignorant. As someone who bears hadiths, he's memorized them, he has an ijazah, he has a degree, he may not have much of the hadith actually with him in his actual life. And we can see this today in the modern world, unfortunately. He says here, Khatib, he says, 
Those who don't implement their knowledge and don't look after it as if they don't even what? Know it whatsoever. Moving forward, he says, And a person should always keep in mind that Allah will ask him, why did he seek knowledge? And he reward him based off of what he did with that knowledge. Khairan, inshallah. Moving forward, Athani. ذكر ما ينبغي للراوي والسامع أن يتميز به من الأخلاق الشريفة. ذكر في سفر ذكر جملة فيها يجمعها حديث أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إنما بعثت لأتمم صالح الأخلاق. طيب the next point will summarize. الثالث ذكر ما يجب على طلب حديث من الاحتراف للعيال واكتساب الحلال. Nani talks about making a living. He talks about making a what? Making a living, having income. And if you have a family, looking after that family and taking care of that family. So if you have a family, a wife and children, he says it's disliked for you to totally devote yourself to seeking hadith and you're their only source of income. You're their sole breadwinner, you can't do just that. But you have to have some type of income and some way of feeding them. And that's because the Prophet ﷺ, he says, it is a sufficient amount of sin for a person to waste those who are dependent upon him. We're here, we'll stop for the event. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina Muhammad. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي Allah.
الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله
استووا سدوا الخلل هذا بين المناكب والاقدام استووا الله اكبر الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وإن تبدوا ما في أنفسكم أو تخفوه يحاسبكم به الله فيغفر لمن يشاء ويعذب من يشاء والله على كل شيء قدير آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده طيب الله اكبر سبحان الله اكبر الله أكبر سبحان ربي العالمين سبحان الله الرحمن الرحيم الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت 
ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إياك الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله أكبر الله أكبر سبحان الله الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam wa Inshallah, we're going to continue with the class. And uh, for the brothers that are coming in right now, uh, we have Sheikh uh, Mufti uh, Munir, uh, Ibn Munir Muhammad with us here. He'll be with us here tonight, tomorrow, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as well, inshallah, uh, covering different variety of lectures, inshallah. Today and tomorrow, he'll be covering uh, the etiquettes of a disciple, so etiquettes of a student of knowledge, somebody that wants to learn. We'll be covering that today and tomorrow, inshallah. We'll be starting tomorrow at 7.30, inshallah. We'll go close to Isha. So we'll go 7.30 to Isha, inshallah. This is today and tomorrow. He'll be with us on Friday as well, uh, doing the halaqa, and as well as Saturday and Sunday covering a series uh, of uh, books, uh, compilation of the books of hadith, and uh, how to, uh, they will come together, inshallah. So that'll be on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, today he'll be doing the etiquettes of a student of knowledge. And on Friday, we have a special lecture uh, for families, inshallah. So we're going to continue right away. So we ask the brothers to, uh, if you're going to pray a sunnah, please pray on this side. And we're going to get started right away, inshallah. And everybody's welcome to attend, inshallah. And yeah, inshallah. And he'll be doing the khutbah as well. Barakallah fikum.
Test, test. طيب بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد. Now this point that we just explained or went over briefly before we offer Salat al-Maghrib, it doesn't mean that a person isn't a sacrifice, brother or sister, husband or husband and wife, mother or father, but it means that you can't waste your wife and your children, and which they don't have the basic bare necessities because you're absolutely, totally devoted to seeking and learning hadith. But sacrificing, not having the luxuries, not having some of the extra comforts, that's a different story. And my advice is, with regards to a brother or a sister, is make sure that you're compatible for a person before you marry them. If you marry a brother who know, and you know this brother is devoted to his studies, and he's serious about his studies, <clears throat> A brother who has both talent, he has a good deal of talent, he has potential, and he's also, as we said, dedicated and hardworking. Don't marry the brother because you think he's handsome, which many sisters they do. He's cute. His knowledge is, you know, on the side, but I'm marrying him because I like the way he looks, or he's funny, or he has a good personality, or he dresses nice. He's handsome. He always looks nice. If that's the main distinguishing feature that a person has, that's what you should marry him for initially, as the main thing. And it doesn't mean you're just marrying him because he's a superstar or you're gold digging for ill, no. But what purpose is you being married to someone whose day and night, their daily life is ilm, 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 ilm. And you have no desire, no concern about that lifestyle. There lies no doubt it's gonna be a time bomb. It's waiting to explode. This hardship, this difficulty, this sacrifice, this problem, and the first thing she's going to say, I'm not happy. The only thing you do is study. The only thing you know is studying. The only thing you care about is studying. The only thing that makes sense to you is studying. 
And he's going to say, well, that's my life. Before you marry me, you knew that was my life. Everybody understand this? Or the exact opposite. You marry your sister. Huh? You don't marry her because she's studious. And you knew that she didn't have the greatest amount of beauty. She wasn't the most attractive. She wasn't the, from this background or this lineage. She didn't have these things like that. And her main thing, the thing that makes her the most beautiful, beautiful is ilm. And you have no desire for that? That makes no sense. It makes no sense for you to be with someone and their main highlighting point you're not even interested in. That's unreasonable. That's, a, that's what? It's unreasonable. You can marry somebody for other reasons. He's knowledgeable, he's studious, and he's also handsome. Alhamdulillah. But the strongest feature that he has is his religion and his ilm. For you to have no concern whatsoever about that strong, that main feature, that doesn't make too much sense. And as I said, it's bound to be a clash. It's bound to be a what? A clash. So if you're not willing to sacrifice and go through hardships for studying, then that's something that you shouldn't get yourself involved in. As far as the husband wasting his family, not giving them the necessary things that they need, then that's what Al Khatib is talking about right here. Everybody understand this? So a sister, she says, my husband didn't look after me, he didn't take care of me, and the sister, she ends up leaving Islam. Or she ends up leaving the sunnah. I don't want to practice sunnah, I don't want to wear niqab and hijab and gloves, I don't want to do none of that stuff anymore. She can't blame that on the system, but she has to blame that on the abuse of her husband of the system, because the system clearly tells us what? Not to do that. And most problems that the people have are based off of personal or cultural issues. And the system is really at fault. But the people, they blame it. The average person who leaves Islam, nine out of ten apostates, you find most of them, they only apostatize or leave Islam because of personal issues that they thought were Sharia issues. The Sharia never said this. There's no verse in the Quran that states this, that a woman has to walk 15 paces behind her husband. Where does it say that in what hadith? Or is no honor killing in the deen? These things don't exist. Those are cultural perversions that have become Islamicized. And the people, they think, oh, well, this is Islam, and it's not Islam. Everybody clear this or not? So it's very important for understanding this, is that there is a system of seeking ilm. And we said the general classes, the general have a class, do this, do that. But for us to be professionals, then we have to have a fine-tooth comb and know the specific adab with the general adab, the specific finely-tuned issues, as we've explained before. And I'm, and this is one of them, is to have some type of trade, some type of skill, some type of way of making a basic living. And it doesn't mean that you're going to have uh, the finest of things every single day. Ever clear this or not? Khair inshallah. Moving forward. al rabiu al rabiu dhikru ma yajibu taqdimu hafdihi al hadith. Prioritizing. Prioritizing what you are to study and what you are to memorize. A student of knowledge must prioritize. Time is limited. Energy is limited. Resources, resources are limited. So you have to be smart and wise, and that comes through prioritizing. You can't study everything all at once. Rather, bell, there's certain things in which you say you don't have time to study at all. Not at once. There's no time. You don't have time to get in. You don't have time, especially if your time overseas is limited. When you graduate, when you leave the school, that's a different story. And some of our Mashaykh would tell us, certain books they would say don't read when you're in the Jamia. You read these books in your country. When you go home, you've graduated, then you study certain books. But here you have a limited amount of time. Limited amount of time. So you must prioritize what you study and what you memorize. Before you memorize hadiths and devote yourself to hadith in the way of hadith, there are other things that should come first. That should come first. Those are... ينبغي للطالب أن يبدأ بحفظ كتاب الله عز وجل إذ كان أجل العلوم وأولاها بالسبق والتقديم فإذا رزقه الله تعالى حفظ كتابه فليحذر أن يشتغل عنه بالحديث أو غيره من العلوم اشتغالا يؤدي إلى نسيانه طيب the Quran takes precedence the most virtuous the most superior thing and when a person has memorized the Quran or نزك الله خيرا even if a person doesn't memorize the entire Qur'an, because that's an issue in itself, it's not necessarily a condition. It's not a binding condition for a person to memorize the entire Qur'an. But for a person who has memorized the entire Qur'an, 
then he should not be so preoccupied with other things in which he forgets what he's memorized of the Qur'an. person specializes in hadith, specializes in fiqh, specializes in seerah, that doesn't mean that you now forget the Qur'an. Everybody understand this? And some of the ulama of Islam, they say forgetting the Qur'an is from the major sins. And the reason why they say it's haram, not it's haram to forget your human being, but they say you only forget the Qur'an based off of neglecting it. Based off of neglecting it. And they said that's the only way that you forget the Qur'an. Because Allah says, وَلَقَدَ يَسَّرْنَا Allah says, we have made the Qur'an easy. We have made it simplified. The Qur'an, a person is divinely facilitated. You, do you understand this? It's not like no other book. So for you to forget something that is so simple and divinely facilitated, that proves that you yourself were doing what? Awali, going against what? You were going against the grain by abandoning it and neglecting it and disobeying its commands. Everybody understand this? Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. Um, he says, ثُمَّ الَّذِي يَتْلُوا الْقُرْآنَ فضل. ثم الذي يتلو القرآن من العلوم أحاديث رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وسننه فيجب على الناس طلبها إذ كانت أس الشريعة وقاعدتها قال الله تعالى وما أتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا وقال تعالى من يطع الرسول فقد أطاع الله وقال وما ينطق عن الهوى أنا محمد أخبرنا أخبرنا محمد بن أحمد بن يعقوب أن أخبرنا محمد بن نعيم الضبي أخبرني محمد بن يوسف بن ريحان قال حدثني أبي قال سمعت أبا عبد الله محمد ابن إسماعيل يعني البخاري يقول أفضل المسلمين رجل أحيا سنة من سنن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قد أميتت فاصبروا يا أصحاب السنن رحمكم الله فإنكم أقل الناس الله أكبر he says here, then after, after the Qur'an comes the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, the sunnah. He says the people must seek it and learn it because that is the foundation of the deen. The foundation of the sharia or the hadith of the Prophet As Allah Azza wa mentions in several ayat in the Kitab Al-Aziz, وَمَا أَتَاكُمْ مِنْ رَسُولُ Whatever the Messenger gives you, then take it. He who obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah. And the messenger never speaks from his own desires. And then Al-Khatib, rahimahullah, listen to this beautiful quote. He mentions his sanad, his isnad. And it says, Ana, yani akhbarana. Huh? You have to learn the different codes hmm, of the tahammul wal ada. Hadathani, thana, ana, na. He gives his isnad that goes back to Imam al-Bukhari who says, the best of Muslims is a man who revives a sunnah that has been, in, that has been what? Abandoned. That has died, quote unquote. That the people have forgotten about, the people are ignorant about, the people have stopped implementing. He says this is the, the, the best of the Muslims. He says here, فَاصْبِرُوا ya أَصْحَابُ sunan. He says, oh people of hadith, people of sunnah, be patient because you are the vast minority. Then Imam al-Bukhari lived in what generation? What century? Huh? Third century. So if he's saying that the people of Hadith are the what? Minority, what about the GTA in 2018? Are you understanding this? In the world in which the kuffar, huh? As the Prophet ﷺ is called to have said, يُشِكُ أَن تَتَدَى عَلَيْكُمُ الْأُمَمْ كَمَا تَتَدَى عَلَكَلَةُ عَلَى قَصْعَتِهَا is that the people will come together against you like people who are invited to a banquet come and eat on one platter in which there's so much political pressure and influence Muslims being killed and slaughtered huh? and in which the people are in love with the way of the kuffar imitating them, looking like them, wanting to be like them in which they're physically harming, annoying and harassing people that are trying to follow and learn and practice the sunnah every time you travel this is what happens to you Everybody understand this? We're going to force you into submission. You want to do this? You want to say this? You want to be about this? No problem. You're now going to what? You're going to suffer. And the moment you give up your values and you compromise and you say what we want you to say and what our interpretation of Islam is, you have no problem and no worries. This is the times in which we live. The times in which we what? In which we live. In which they physically torture people. And if they can't physically torture you because you live in a certain country, then they'll torture you in other means. 
for you being a person of sunnah and refusing to bend and twist of the modern politically correct interpretation of what Islam is supposed to be. So if this is the case of, if that was Imam al-Bukhari's time, then what about what? Nowadays. And there was none of those things back then. Was no, there was no West in the time of Imam al-Bukhari. Everybody understand this? There was, there was this agency, these, there was none of those things, what? In the time of Imam al-Bukhari. And he said that the people of the Sunnah are the what? Aqallun nas. So this is a lesson for us to be taken. Huh? Is be patient. Be easy. Because the people of the Sunnah are always going to be the what? The vast minority. But it doesn't matter how small or how big. That's not important. What's important is, is that you have the truth, the quality. Bidnai subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib. He then says, Qal al-Shaykh Abu Bakr, Qawl al-Bukhari, in ashab al-Sunni, aqal al-Nas, ana bihi al-Huffad al-Hadith, al-Alimin. بطرقه المميزين لصحيحه من سقيمه وقد صدق رحمه الله في قوله لأنك إذا اعتبرت لن تجد بلدا من بلدان الإسلام يخلو من فقيه أو متفقه يرجو أهل مصره إليه يعولون في فتاويهم عليه وتجد الأمصار الكثيرة خارية من صاحب حديث عارف به مجتهد فيه وما ذاك إلا لصعوبة علمه وعزته وقلة من ينجب فيه من سامعه وكتبته وقد كان العلم في وقت البخاري غضا طريا والارتسام به محبوبا شهيا والدواء إليه أكبر ورغبة فيه أكثر وقال هذا القول الذي حكينا عنه فكيف نقول في هذا الزمان ما عدم الطالب وقلة الراغب He says here, the Sheikh Bakr says that Imam al-Bukhari statement أصحاب السنن he means scholars of hadith who are learned and who have a proper understanding and proper mastery of hadith. Those who know the ins and the outs, authentic and inauthentic, weak and sound, etc. He says, and this is a true statement of Imam al-Bukhari. And that's because if you just look at geography, he says, use the dalil of geography. Look at the countries around the world. He says, in most places, if not all of them, you're going to find some type of faqih. Some type of mutafaqir, some type of mufti, some type of qadi, some type of Islamic cleric, some type of Islamic figure that gives the decisions and the verdicts, and which the people go back to, they ask him questions, he's the one who gets on the news, he speaks about, he makes a statement for the Muslims, he apologizes, huh, for an act that the Muslims, what, didn't do. The Muslims didn't make this attack, but he makes a what? He don't, no, an apology. How is this? How do you apologize for something that you didn't do? Can you explain to me how that works? I was not there. I had nothing to do with that incident. If it even took place and happened, how am I now liable and responsible for doing what? Apologizing. Wallahi, that's something which is, yani, men, that's from the most mind-boggling things of the modern world in which we live. And which I have to make a statement about something which I have what? Nothing to do with. Huh? So just stop and reflect on this. Huh? So he says here that in every country there's some type of faqih or some type of mutafaqih. He says, however, you'll find many villages, many towns, many states, many countries in which there's not one hadith scholar. There's not one hadith master. He says, khali And that's because learning hadith and seeking hadith is something which is difficult. It's something which is burdensome. It doesn't come easily. And it's something which isn't that easy and simple for a person to excel in. For a person to what? For a person to excel in. These sciences, these fields are much easier. They're flashier. But hadith science is back-breaking. It's something that takes longer. It takes more dedication, more devotion. And the, the limelight that you may get may not be like the what? That which is a fiqh. In which I had people in my class <coughs> is well known. Or people that didn't go to the college of hadith. Who wanted to go to the college of hadith? But they were forced to go to Sharia. And they would say, said, if I go back to my country, there's no value of me having a degree in Hadith. They won't even consider a Hadith degree. They'll say it's useless. Use it as a paper, a, 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 paper, uh, a napkin. There's nothing that you can do with Hadith. And we're talking about Muslim countries. You have a Sharia degree, marhaba. You can be the Imam. You can work in the courthouse. You can do this. You can do that. But Hadith, ah, there's not much you can do with that here. They would say this. And say, we would literally starve. If we went back to our countries with these degrees from Jamia Islamiyah for Hadith, they wouldn't even look at it. This is a reality. 
So the point is that there are many lands in which no one has knowledge of hadith, but everyone wants the what? The faqih. Everyone wants some type of what? Some type of faqih, some type of fatwa giver. Are we clear on this or not? He says here, uh, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says, the time of Imam al-Bukhari, he says, ilm was fresh. It was organic. It's in tari. Huh? It was sweet and juicy. Everyone wanted some of, of hadith. That's when you find most of the ulama of the third century, most of them, they study what? They study hadith. They travel from country to country, they understand hadith. He says, and despite that, Imam al-Bukhari, he what? He made that statement. So what do you think about this time period? And Shaykh Bakr, rahimahullah, he died many years ago in Saudi Arabia. The years in which he passed away, the country of Saudi Arabia and the western countries are still like what? Night and day, let alone the time of Imam al-Bukhari. Everybody understand how scary this is? And if we live, if Allah gives us life, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, we'll be telling our children and our grandchildren the stories of the books that we used to study. And we had to read this. We had to have an iPad. They'd be like, an iPad? You had an iPad? Now, Allah Alam, what type of technology we have 50 years later? You had to actually download a book on a computer? You had to use Wi-Fi to put it on a MacBook? Huh? We're going to tell our children that. And they're going to look at it as something that is unbelievable. Just like the people that came before us. There was no iPad. There was no Maktab al-Shamila. There was no flat screen. There was none of these things. There was nothing but books. And then the people who came what? Before them. Wahakitha. Everybody understand this? So as time goes on, the people become further and further. Why the billah? Tayyib al-Khamis. Al-Qawl fil al-Sanid al-Aliyya. إذا عز إذا عزم الله تعالى الأمر على سماع الحديث وحضرته نية في الاشتغال وحضرته وحضرته ني نية في الاشتغال به فينبغي أن يقدم المسألة لله أن يوفقه فيه ويعينه عليه ثم ثم يبادر إلى السماع ويحرص على ذلك من غير توقف ولا تأخير ويعمد إلى أسند شيوخ مصره وأقدمهم سماع سماعا فيديم الاختلاف إليه ويواصل العكوف عليه ومذاهب الناس تختلف في ذلك فمنهم من يكتفي بسماع الحديث نازلا مع وجود من يرويه عاليا ومنهم, ومنهم من لا يقتنع بذلك ولا يقتصر على النزول وهو يجد العلو وأهل النظر أيضا مختلفون في ذلك فمنهم من يرى أن السماع السماع النازل أفضل لأنه يجب على الراوي أن يجتهد في معرفة جرح من يروي عنه وتعديله والاجتهاد في أحوال رواة النازل أكثر وكان الثواب فيه أوفر, أوفر ومنهم من يرى أن السماع العالي أفضل لأن المجتهد مخاطر وسقوط بعض الإسناد مستقر The next point in brief to summarize it This is an etiquette that is specific to hadith Because that's the asal of our discussion this is not a class open for just anybody. We said this is for a specific breed of people that we're trying to address in this class. The general lectures, the general talks. Here we're talking about the etiquette of disciples of hadith specifically. And from that is that which is called seeking a sanad, which is Ali, al isnad al Ali. And al isnad al Ali is very simple and it's very basic. Look at it like this. Let's say, for example, your mother tells you a story and your mother says I got this from my father your grandfather and your grandfather he's alive but he lives in a different part of Canada he lives in a different area or a different section of Canada but your mother is telling you something that she got from her father so you take what your mother said or if you wanted to you could travel to your grandfather and listen to him directly and cut out the middle woman who is your mother or let's say great grandfather your mother's father's father everybody understand this your mother is telling you a story from her from her grandfather from her what from her grandfather so what you could do is do what now skip your mother skip your grandfather and then go meet your great-grandfather. Everybody clear on this or not? So you have a shorter chain. You have two ways of getting the information. One has three people and one only has one. Everybody understand this? So the chain of narration that contains three people is called a sanad al-nazil. A sanad al-nazil. And the chain that only has one or two people is called a sanadish al-ali. Al-isnad al-ali. 
Huh? Like you study in Biquniya or Tadkira. Huh? Al Ali. So you can cut out the middleman and then minimize the intermediaries. Or you can suffice yourself with having a longer chain. I don't need to go and hear it from my great grandfather. I can just take it from my mother. She's trustworthy. Or we'll heard it from my father, etc. Everybody understand this? So, this is an etiquette here when it comes to learning and seeking hadith. Should you stay in your country and have a longer chain? Or should you get on your horse, travel, and get and obtain a what? Shorter chain. Everybody understand this? A what? A shorter chain of narration. Al Khatib, Rahim al Ta'ala, he says that a person should travel and minimize the people that are in the chain. Less people is a shorter, cleaner chain, let alone is the concept of earning what you get. Everybody understand this? Earning what you get. When you go out and get something, it's not the same as someone delivering it to you. Having more appreciation and more value for that thing. Khairan, inshallah. So this goes to show you here, from one thing you learn 10,000 things. When we study something in Bequaniya or Nukhbat al-Fikr, we also apply it here to the actual real world as well. Khairan, inshallah. As-Sadis. As-Sadis, takhayyur al-Shuyukh. He says here also the concept of taking the oldest of the teachers that you can find. In other words, to minimize the newer people. Everybody understand this? In Medina, we have teachers who are students of Sheikh Abdul Masan al Abad. And they're older than us. This teacher is 40 years old or 50 years old. And he's a student of Sheikh Abdul Masan. So he's telling us what Sheikh Abdul Masan said 20 years ago or 30 years ago in the Prophet Masjid. And I can just do what now? I can what? Bypass him and go directly to Sheikh Abdul Masan. Everybody understand this? And in which Nan is a Sanad is Nan Ali. Tayyib. Number six. تخير الشيوخ إذا تباينت أوصافهم درجات الرواة لا تتساوى في العلم فيقدم السماع ممن على إسناده على ما ذكرنا فإن تكافأت أسانيد جماعة من الشيوخ في العلو وأراد الطالب أن ينصفر على السماع من بعضهم فينبغي التخير المشهور منهم بطلب الحديث المشار إليه بالإتقان له والمعرفة به وإذا تساووا في الإسناد والمعرفة فمن كان من الأشراف وذوي الأنساب فهو أولى بأن يسمع منه وبسنده عن شعبة قال حدثوا عن أهل الشرف فإنهم لا يكذبون هذا كله بعد استقامة الطريقة وثبوت العدالة والسلامة من البدعة فأما من لم يكن على هذه الصفة فيجب العدول, العدول عنه واجتناب السماع منه وذكر بسنده, وذكر. وذكر بسنده عن إبراهيم قال كانوا إذا أتوا الرجل ليأخذوا عنه نظروا إلى سمته وإلى صلاته وإلى حاله ثم يأخذون عنه طيب. The next point he says here is that when the teachers have similar qualities and characteristics in one aspect, but from another aspect, some are more virtuous than others, how do you pick who to sit with, who to study with? What teacher should you take? Very important point here. And this is something which can save you from a great deal of confusion when you go overseas and study. Who to sit with? and who not to sit with. And it doesn't mean just because I don't sit with this one that it's something that's negative or derogatory or I don't like him or no, it doesn't mean that. But you have to once again prioritize. And there is a system of prioritizing. There's a what? A system in prioritizing. So he says here, darajatul ruwati la tatasawa fil idn. He says everyone is not on the same level when it comes to learning hadith. Everyone is not on the what? The same level. He says, so first and foremost, we previously mentioned about those who have qidam al sama who have shorter chains of narration. They've been around longer. They're more skilled. They're more well-known. He says, so therefore, those who are known for being precise and those who are known of having a great deal of skill and experience, as far as if the people are equal in their skill, if they're equal in their experience, he says that one should look towards lineage. They should look towards what? Lineage and genealogy. He says people who are noble, if you had to choose between one or two sheikhs and they both have the same level of skill, he says they give precedence to one who's from the what? The Ashraf, the nobles. And obviously things are very different in our modern time. The French Revolution. It's very hard to read certain things like this and to truly understand them. But back in the day, things were very, very, very different. And this majlis, this city that we have right now, probably wouldn't have exist existed a couple hundred years ago. There would be no noble sitting with a peasant 
and the same platform, everyone in the same classroom. Everybody understand this? Things didn't work like that. The servant, the slave, the master, the highborn, the king, this one, the aristocrat, the courtier, the people didn't mix and mingle how people mix and mingle today. Everybody understand this in history? Or are we, everybody with me or not? Things didn't exist like how they are today. Everybody clear on this or not? People still have these types of uh, stigmas or these different types of, uh, 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 they're stuck up on certain things, but it's nothing like how things were back then. And this is why you find many stories of some of the scholars of Hadith, they were refused to give personal classes to the leader or to the leader's children, like Abu Dawood, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he said, knowledge is for everyone. Your nobility, your genealogy, your status has nothing to do with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But it was a reality. There was a what? There was a reality. Also, a person's background and a person's lineage, just because Islam says, in akramakum and the at qakum, it doesn't mean that lineage and genealogy has no place in Islam. And it doesn't mean that a person's background isn't important. And oftentimes, someone's background can force them or prevent them from certain virtues and certain vices just because where a person is from. And sometimes a person may not do it out of taqwa, but he may do it out of shame. I'm ashamed of embarrassing my family name. I'm ashamed of losing my reputation. For the good or for the what? Or for the bad. So if you have someone who has the proper knowledge, the proper qualifications, and they come from a well-known background, then it only makes sense to do what? To take that person. And it's one less excuse for the people to accept the message of the truth. And that's why Heraclius, Herakl, he asked Abu Sufyan about Muhammad. Where does he come from? What's his lineage like? And he says that he's from the best from among us. And Herakl, he says, وَكَذَلِكَ Rusul. He says, and that is the case of the messengers. Meaning in the biblical scriptures, the messengers are always sent from the what? Top lineage. And that's because it gives the people one less excuse. Huh? Everybody understand this? People that are low and base, no one wants to follow them. They want to follow the noble people, the strong people, the, for, the people in the forefront. Everyone understand this or not? So if the messenger is telling the people to avoid something that their forefathers have been doing, their ancestors have been doing, and this and that, and so on and so forth, and he's of low lineage, then they're going to say, we're not going to follow him. Look at his background. Everybody understand this? But if he comes from a good, strong lineage, then that's one less what? One less excuse. Everybody understand his wisdom. Khairan, inshallah. So he, he mentions that this is one of the points here. And the finely tuned etiquettes are taken from the shiuch with certain characteristics. He says, but this isn't enough, Khalid. It's not just based off of someone's blood. He says, looking at someone's genealogy after istiqamat al tariqah A person being forthright. A person being righteous. A person being on the sunnah. A person being a qualified scholar of hadith, a person being free from bid'ah, then you look towards the other points. Everybody clear on us or not? And many people they get caught up and they get stuck on lineology, on race, and on blood, and they lose focus on the initial point. This person is the most qualified teacher, period, and he comes from low lineage. This person isn't the most qualified teacher, but he comes from high lineage. So I'm going to study with him and not study with that person. That's a capital mistake. Everybody clear on us or not? Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. He mentions the statement here of Ibrahim al nakhai rahimahullah, that whenever they want to study hadith with someone, they will look towards his behavior. And they will look towards how he offered the salah. And they will look to how he treated people and dealt with people. And then they will what? They will take from him, huh? Not just his name, who he was, and what the people said about him. Khairan, inshallah. Fadda, dhikru. Dhikru mimma yujtanab al min. في ترك السماع من الفاسق اتفق أهل العلم على أن السماع ممن ثبت فسقه لا يجوز ويثبت الفسق بأمور كثيرة لا تختص بالحديث فما ما يختص بالحديث منها فمثل أن يضع متون الحديث على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو أسانيد المتون ويقال إن الأصل في التفتيش عن حال الرواه كان لهذا السبب ومنها أن يدعي السماع ممن لم يلقه ولهذه العلة قيد الناس, من قيد الناس مواليد الرواة وتاريخ موتهم فوجدت روايات لقوم عن شيوخ قصرت أسنانهم عن إدراكهم طيب, the next point it says the people that you shouldn't study with the exact opposite the, the scholars, the teachers that you should avoid that you must stay away from and avoid 
First and foremost, he mentions the fasiq, wicked people, sinful people, mutinous people, people that don't have righteousness and piety. He says there's no difference of opinion among the people of knowledge that those who are proven to be fusaq, you are not allowed to learn from them. You're not supposed to listen to them and take narrations from them. If they're proven to be what? Fasics. Rebecca He says here, and it isn't specific to hadith. There are reasons behind a person being declared a fasik in Islam. As far as hadith reasons, then for someone to fabricate narrations, to make up a hadith, to fabricate a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu to fabricate the Yasanid, make up different chains of narration. And some people, they say that this was the original reason why the people began to investigate narrators. The science of Ilm al-Rijal started off like this, because people were lying. He says, oh, a person claiming to have met someone that they didn't actually what? Didn't actually meet. And that is why the people began to record the dates of birth and death, to prove that there are people who are lying. How did you meet this person and he died 10 years before you were born? How did you learn from this person and he had left Toronto 20 days before you arrived? Everybody understand this? This is the day of his flight. This is the day of your flight. It's impossible for you to have met that person. Everybody understand this? Because the people, they begin to lie and exaggerate. He says, so someone who makes fisk, whether it's outside of hadith or whether it is what? Inside of hadith. Everybody clear this or not? You can make fisk inside of hadith by doing these things, or you can be a fasik having nothing to do with one's studies. Are you clear this or not? Tayyip, fadl. Wadabtu a. Wadabtu ashab. Wadabta. Wadabta ashab al hadith sifat al ulama wa hi wa hi atihim wa ahwalihim aydan li hadi al gila wa qad iftadah ghayr wahid min al ruwati fi mithli dalik. Tayyip, mashi. Qal Abu Bakr al Khatib. قال أبو بكر الخطيب وإذا سلم الراوي من وضع الحديث والدعاء السماع ممن لم يلقه وجانب الأفعال التي تسقط بها العدالة غير أنه لم يكن له كتاب بما سمعه فحدث من حفظه لم يصح الاحتجاج بحديثه حتى يشهد له أهل العلم بالأثر والعارفون به أنه ممن قد طلب الحديث وعاناه وضبطه وحفظه Someone who's actually studied Someone who's actually studied Formally studied They have under their belt not someone who's self-taught, someone who popped out of thin air, huh? And this is regardless, whether it's a scholar or a student of knowledge, someone just pops up out of the middle of nowhere, huh? And then they cause fitna and they say this, and then in most cases, history has taught us the people who come out of thin air and they make a great deal of noise and clamor, in most cases they end up what? Back to thin air. But after they've what? Caused a great deal of fitna a great deal of corruption, then they go and they vanish. Everybody understand this? Fadl. Fi tarq al-sama'i. Fi tarq al-sama'i min ahwal, min ahl al-ahwai wal bid'a, wa bi sanadihi an al-thawri, yaqul, man sami'a min mubtada'in lam yanfa'ahu Allah bima sami'a, wa man safahahu faqad naqad al-islam urwatan urwa. وإذا كان الراوي من أهل الأهواء والمذاهب التي تخالف الحق لم يسمع منه ونعرف بالطلب والحفظ. طيب. The next point is similar to pertaining to adala is someone who's an innovator or someone who's practicing innovations from the people of ahwa, the people of desires, the people of bid'ah. So not the 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 the, line, the point is extremely clear is that your sheikh is supposed to be someone who's prime in all aspects. He's not supposed to have major flaws pertaining to his piety, pertaining to bid'ah, pertaining to his or her qualifications, a well-rounded pound-for-pound -pound package. Everybody clear on this? هذا هو المقصود is that they don't have any major khalal, huh? inwardly and outwardly, and not just one aspect, duna akhar. So, person of innovations, we don't take from. But this person who's supposed to be upon the haqq and the way of the salaf, He's a well-known sinner, a well-known fasik. We can take from him. We say no. It has to be here and it has to be what? There. All well-rounded balance. So he mentions a few athar here with regards to warning from taking from Ahlul Bidah and the people of Al Ahwa. Uh, and not to learn from them even if they're known from having precision and even if they're known for being skilled. Obviously, هذا يحتاج إلى تفصيل. هذا بهذا الإطلاق لا يصح أبدا. بهذا من الأحوال. بهذا الإطلاق 
لابد من تقييد ها حتى الثوري كم روى عنه ممن قيل فيه طيب moving forward to the next point ترك السماع ترك السماع ممن لم يعرف أحكام الرواية وإن كان مشهورا بالصلاح والعبادة the next point which proves what we just said is another aspect <coughs> and that is someone who's righteous and pious but they are not scholastically precise they're not skilled in hadith but they pray at night they fast during the daytime they give sadaqah they sit on a saf al awwal they wipe the head of the orphan huh they visit the graves they're pious and they're righteous but they're not scholars and that's another dangerous problem of 2018 when we talk about the youtube personality he's a good person he's a nice older brother look he has henna in his beard he has gray hair he has noor but when did he actually seek ilm? When did this person become a person who's learned the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ? And you'll find that someone giving a tafsir of the Messenger of Allah's statement. This is what this hadith means. This hadith is authentic. This hadith is not authentic. You don't have to implement this. It's not obligatory. And just because a person is righteous, he's on the front row every single day for fajr. Every, he never misses takbir to the haram for any salah that does not qualify him to be a what? A scholar of hadith. And we know what many of the salaf of salah would say. Huh? It says, ما رأينا. He says, we never saw what? قومن أكثر. He says, we never saw people who lied more than the what? Than the righteous. We never saw people who made more fabricated hadith than righteous people. Meaning incidentally or accidentally. They got involved with things that they shouldn't be what? Involved with. You can't pray all night and fast all day. You can't do that and be a scholar of hadith amount of time it has to be dedicated and devoted to what review and sharpening huh your blade keeping it sharp keeping the rust off of it you have to constantly review you have to constantly train and you can't do that if you're passing out at night time from the prayer and if you're feigning in the daytime because your tongue is turning green from fasting it won't work like that all right and that's what they call the ghafla to salihin they were called ghafla to salihin heedlessness of the righteous in which they only devoted themselves to ibadah and they became sloppy and lax and what? And the sciences of hadith. Tayyip, next point. He says here, وَبِي سَنَدِي عَنْ رَجَاءَ يَعْنِي إِبْنْ حَيْوَى أَنُّ قَالَ لِرَجْلٍ حَدِّثْنَا وَلَا تُحَدِّثْنَا عَنْ مُتَمَاوِتٍ وَلَا طَعَانٍ Tayyip, كَرَاهَةُ السَّمَاءَ مِنَ الدُّعَفَاءَ فَضَلُ كراءة السماع من الضعفاء إذا كان الراوي صحيح السماع غير أنه متساهل في الرواية ومعروف بالغفلة فالسماع منه جائز غير أنه مكروه ويضعف حاله بما ذكرنا <coughs> طيب people that are weak they're scholars of hadith but they're not the strongest that's another thing to avoid طيب moving forward السابع أداب الطلب أداب الطلب ينبغي لطالب الحديث أن, يتمي أن يتميز في عامة أموره عن طرائق القوم باستعمال آثار رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم طيب we mentioned that already and we'll summarize this for lack of time with regards to the akhlaq of the messenger of Allah and that's the purpose of the book obviously and using the akhlaq of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم in every single aspect of your life of every aspect of your life as a student of hadith if you're unwilling or if you're not capable of doing this, then you should not devote yourself to the study of hadith. Being a disciple is not for you if you're not willing to try and to implement that. He says, وَيَجِبُ عَلَى طَالِبَ الْحَدِيثِ أَنْ يَتَجَنَّبَ الْلَعَبِ وَالْعَبِثِ وَالْتَبَذُّلِ فِي الْمَجَالِسِ بِالسُّخْفِ وَالضَّحْكِ وَالْقَحْقَهَةِ وَكَثْرَةِ التَّنَادُرِ وَإِدْمَانَ الْمِزَاحِ وَالْأَكْثَرِ مِنْ فَإِنَّمَا وطريفه الذي لا يخرج عن حد الأدب وطريقة العلم فما متصله وفاحشه وسخيفه وما أوغر منه الصدور وجلب الشر فإنه مذموم وكثرة المزاح والضحك يضع من القدر ويزيل المرؤة He talks about joking too much, laughing too much, playing around too much and how it takes away from one's seriousness and from one's awe and causes people to lose respect when he jokes too much and he laughs too much. He says making a joke every now and then, smiling, something which is permissible, something which is interesting and subtle, it's one thing. 
but just dying and rolling on the floor all day, every day, and never being serious and never being upfront and serious, he says, and that is a huge no-no. And then people will not respect you if that is how you deal with them and that is how you behave with them. It's a very serious issue here. And many of us, we infringe on this issue on a daily basis, unfortunately. And of course, certain things are relative. The time of Khatib al-Baghdadi is very different from our time, of course. Certain things that we would laugh about and we would consider to be balanced, not even being, you know, laughing and joking too much, they may consider to be too much. They may consider that to be extreme, but it's a different time in a different what? A different place. And there's all of these etiquettes which are not concrete, the ones that are based off of relative time and place, that's how they are to be what? Understood. How old do you have to be to seek hadith? How old should you be before you teach a class? How many people do you have to hear from? Imam Malik, he says, I met all of these scholars, 50 scholars, 100 scholars, they all gave me ijaz and so on and so forth. That's for the time of Imam Malik and in place of Imam Malik. That's not our time and our place. You may not even have a hundred scholars in your country, let alone in your city. Everybody understand this? Khairan, inshallah. So this is a very important point here to have a balance and to minimize always laughing and dying and joking too much. Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. Al-Thamin. Adab al-istidhani al-muhaddith wa al-dukhuli alayhi. قال أبو بكر إذا وجد الطالب الراوي نائما فلا ينبغي له أن يستأذن عليه بل يجلس وينتظر استيقاظه أو أو ينصرف إن شاء. The etiquette of entering upon the hadith master. Do you just go into his house or his room or his dojo or his masjid? Do you knock first? What if he's asleep? What do you do? If there's a class online, he doesn't answer the phone. Do you call again? Obviously, this is relative. And there are certain teachers that will become angry if you don't call, if you don't knock. They become upset with you and say, why didn't you come in? You were sleeping, Sheikh. They say, you're supposed to w waking me up. I was waiting for you to call me on Skype. I was waiting for you to call me. Isn't this okay? And then there are other people that become aggravated and annoyed. So this, is, this goes to show you that it's formless and every teacher is different. Every muhaddith is what? It's different. Some people become extremely annoyed and others don't what? They don't mind. So you have to know your teacher. You have to know your what? You have to know your teacher. There is no concrete rule. The basic rule is, is to show the utmost amount of respect to your teacher. The one who's giving you hadith and feeding you these narrations is for you to show him the what? Utmost respect. How that is manifested, how that is specifically applied, that varies from what? Min shakhsin ila shakhs. And it's very important, and it can save you a lot of heartache when you understand the concept of formless. طيب, next point. كيفية الوقوف. كيفية الوقوف على باب المحدث للاستئذان. إذا كان باب الدار المحدث مفتوحا فينبغي للطالب أن يقف قريبا منه ويستأذن. وإن كان الباب وإن كان الباب مردودا فله أن يقف حيث شاء منه ويستأذن. ويكره للطالب إذا استأذن فقيل من ذا أن يقول أنا من غير أن يسمي نفسه. طيب. <coughs> this goes to show you how advanced the Muslims were of the rest, above the rest of the world. Look how detailed the etiquettes get, even to the point of standing at the door. What is the proper way of standing at the door? Should your head be low, stand on the right side, on the left side, if the door is open, if the door is locked? It goes to show you the finely tuned details of seeking hadith. This was over uh, approximately a thousand, what, years ago. I recognize this how advanced the Muslims were. So he says here, if the door is open, then you should stand close by the door and don't enter the door. If the door is closed, etc. Once again, this, de this depends on the what? On the teacher. If the sheikh says, come over my house after Salat al-Asr, the door will be open. You stand out there and you wait. The, teacher is in, the sheikh is inside making tea. He's gathering the dates and the coffee. Like many of the sheikh would do in Medina themselves. You wait, you wait, he says, why didn't you come in? Why do you enter? He says, Shaykh, no, it's Allah. I told you to come over. So it depends on the teacher as well, as we previously said. Naam? And he says, it says, who is it? You should never say, it's me. It's me. Rather, give your name. وَلَا يَجُوزُ الدُّخُولُ عَلَى الْمُحَدِّثِ وَلَا يَجُوزُ الدُّخُولُ عَلَى الْمُحَدِّثِ مِنْ غَيْرِ اسْتِئِذَانِ فَمَنْ ذَعَلْ فَمَنْ فَمَنْ ذَعَلَ ذَلِكُ أُمْرَ بِالْخُرُوجِ وَأَنْ يَسْتَأَذِنَ لِيَكُونَ التَّأَدِيبَ لَهُ فِي الْمُسْتَقْ
وإذا حضر جماعة من الطلبة باب المحدث وأذن لهم في الدخول فينبغي يقدموا أسنهم ويدخلوه أمامهم فإن ذلك هو السنة وإن قدم الأكبر على نفسه من كان أعلم منه جاز ذلك وكان حسنا كراهة تسليم الخاصة كراهة تسليم الخاصة إذا دخل الطالب على الرابي فوجد عنده الجماعة فيجب أن يعمهم بالسلام Everyone should get the citations and not just give salams to one person not just give salams to the sheikh or to the teacher everyone deserves the basic right of the salam طيب next point استهباب المشي على البساط حافيا يستحب للطالب ألا يمشي على بساط المحدث إلا بعد نزع عليه من قدميه لمن لا يؤمن أن يكون في النعلين من الأقذار وذلك أيضا من التواضع وحسن الأدب ويجب أن يبتدئ بنزع اليسرى من عليه دون اليمنى طيب he says that when you walk on the carpet of the muhaddith you come to sit with him and study with him then you should take off your sandals take off your shoes he says first and foremost for the purpose of cleanliness and secondly for the purpose of humility and humbleness and to show some type of respect. We're not going to get into the issue of praying with shoes and the cultural clash that many cultures consider coming into the masjid with shoes as a huge cardinal sin. We're not here to discuss that right now and how mukhalif of the sunnah that is and which praying in your shoes is the greatest sin after shirk. Uh, some masjids we've been in Hishan in which you literally have to take off your shoes on the what? the sidewalk, not in the front door, not the steps, not the area, you literally take off your shoes. This was in January, right? It was freezing cold, it was snowing, it was ice. And you had to take off your boots on the sidewalk, literally. You're on the sidewalk, people are walking by and you have to do what? <laughs> you know, sacred valley of Tua. Uh, this is unfortunate. We're not going to get into that right now. Khairan, inshallah. What's important is, is the point is one point and one point only, and that is to show the what? Utmost what? Respect to the teacher. And obviously, many of these adab and these akhlaq are going to be cultural or culturally based, Khalid. If you're from a culture in which people keep their shoes on, then there's nothing wrong with that. If you're from a culture in which people, it's taboo to have your shoes on someone's carpet, then... This proper understanding is the thing which prevents you from ghulu and taking things absolutely and then becoming gung-ho and becoming zealous. I read this, Sufyan Athodi, he said that, Lam Allah, so on and so forth. And not understanding the time and the place and the atmosphere and how many aspects of Islam, many aspects are based off of a time, a place, and a cultural atmosphere. Everybody understand this? What is looked down upon in this culture is not necessarily looked down upon what? In another culture. If we have a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, then there's no speech. There's nothing to say. It's clear as day. But if it's a cultural reference, then it's going to be subjective to the what? To the people. Khairan, inshallah. Wa min al-adab? Wa min al-adab jaloos al-talib haythu yantahi bihi al-majlis wa nahi an takhat al-raqab. Al-karahiyya tu lahu an yuqim rajulan wa yajlis makanah. كراهة الجلوس وسط الحلقة وفي صدرها كراهية الجلوس بين اثنين بغير إذنهما قال أبو بكر ومتى فسح له اثنان ليجلس بينهما فعل ذلك إنها, إنها كرامة أكرم أكرماه بها فلا ينبغي أن يردها With regards to sitting in a circle, the specific adab We know the general adab to sit in a circle But what are the specific adab? He says don't kick people in the back Elbow people, knee people in the shoulders. Excuse me, sorry, pardon me. Out the way, oh, I'm sorry, bismillah, afwan. You just keep moving people out of the way to get closer to the sheikh. And you're half, you're half an hour late. You're 45 minutes late. And you move people out the way. That's a no-no. Just like Juma, huh? Also, he says, getting someone up and then taking their seat. Or sitting in the middle of the circle. Or splitting people up. Sitting between them without their permission. Tayyip, until the point in which he says... ويجب طيب moving forward كراهة القعود كراهية القعود في موضع من قام وهو يريد العودة للمجلس طيب before we move forward إن شاء الله تعالى what time will we stop 10 p.m. is the event 9:45 
is the adhan. All right, so what we'll do, B'nai Ta'ala, we'll stop for the adhan and then uh, take some questions, inshallah, and conclude our session for tonight. Or we're going to take the questions now or after the adhan, Murad? Do the questions after the adhan? Inshallah. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا للصلاة Before we stop, if there's anything pertaining to the class or pertaining to other than the class, inshallah ta'ala will entertain those questions now, if there are any. With regards to what we studied today or anything else before we make Salat al Isha with the night ta'ala. Khairan inshallah. So we have no questions. Tayyip. question says, with regards to reading some of the statements, some of those athar of the Salaf al Salih or scholars of the past, and then using them or implementing them aggressively without the proper context, etc., the time, the place, the atmosphere, etc. I would say, first and foremost, from the things which, you pre which will prevent you from falling to that, that vice is studying usul al fiqh and reading the explanation of the hadith of the Prophet in abundance. Because you'll abundantly find out and you'll see that there are ayat which are interpreted. And which is difference of opinion among the scholars of Islam and what the, ver the words of Allah mean. How many times was this surah sent down? Was this ayah sent down? 
who was this surah or this ayah sent down regarding? Was it this companion or that companion? The hadith of the Prophet والسلام, and they say this is Aam, this is Mutlaq, this is Muqayyad, this is Khas, this is Mansukh, etc. So this is Kitab and Sunnah. There's a science of understanding them. There's a sabab nuzul, there's a sabab burud, there's a sabab tahdith. And these are the words of the Messenger of Allah. فَمَا بَالُكَ bi الثَوْرِ وَفُلَانُ وَعَلَانُ What about this one and this one whose speech from the get-go is not a hujjah? Whose speech from the get-go is not, doesn't possess legal authority? Who speaks, huh? You can't say, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ أَبَا إِمَامْ أَحْمَدُ وَسُفْيَانَ الثَوْرِ Well, no disrespect to them. But Allah sent that down about what? Who? Muhammad ﷺ, no one else. Everybody understand this? So we have to understand is that the Prophet's words are understood. The Prophet's <laughs> words are interpreted. The Prophet's words, certain times, not all times, but certain times they have a time and a place. So that automatically excludes the whole concept of this is what Imam Ahmed or Sufyan Authority says, so I'm going to run with it absolutely without no detail. Another point which will uh, protect you from this is just look how ugly hypocrisy is. And double standard, how ugly it is. Because you'll find someone, if they're an opponent of you or of anyone else, they'll use a statement. Imam Ahmed said this. Don't ever do this, don't ever say this, so on and so forth. And they'll use it absolutely. But if you use a statement of Imam Ahmed or another scholar against them, that's against their agenda or their ulterior motive, they'll say, oh, you don't understand it properly. You're taking it out of context. That's not what Sufyan authority meant. Imam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, he didn't mean that when he said that. So let me get something straight now. You can take a statement and use it without no restrictions, but no one else can take any statements unless they have a whole list of restrictions. That's clearly what? Hypocritical. Everybody understand this? So these are some of the ways that can prevent you from doing this and just having a balanced study. And in most cases, I'll say this, is the only weak people depend on stuff like this. Di'af. People have weak minds and will have a low amount of knowledge they have to resort to this one mutlaq statement and stick to it and push it and give overkill. But someone actually has ilm, who's huh? yani rasim, a good amount of ilm, strongly grounded, doesn't have to stick to that one thing. Nor does he ever have to abuse someone to prove a point. And the first sign of an ignorant person is abuse. Is what? Abuse. They have to verbally abuse you and they have to badger you. But if you truly have knowledge, you have nothing to prove, and there's no need to abuse anyone. There's no need to just put someone down by bat beating them in the head with this one statement. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. That's in brief, Taban. Wallahu alam. Naam fadl. clear. There's no doubt that many things are specific to disciplism, the way of hadith, and there are other things which are general. You have to understand that when we talk about the etiquettes of a student of hadith, most of those etiquettes, not all of them, but most of them, are nothing more than the etiquettes of a normal student of knowledge. And the etiquettes of a normal student of knowledge in most cases are nothing more than the etiquettes of a Muslim. Every Muslim is supposed to be sincere. Every Muslim is supposed to be this. Every Muslim is supposed to have that. But the student of knowledge is supposed to be the cream of the crop. He's supposed to be the best of the best. And the best of the best of the best, the most elite, is supposed to be the student of hadith. He's supposed to be the elite of the elite. Huh? So therefore, there are certain things which are heightened and amplified more in hadith science. And it's more dangerous. It's more important. And as we said before, and there's no disrespect to any other science or field, but there is a great deal of room for all types of mistakes and errors to enter and not like hadith. And the proof of that is, is look at history. You look at the scholars of fiqh, of usul, of lugh al arabiya look how many innovations entered into those sciences. And how many people of innovation and innovators entered into those sciences. And as we said earlier, hadith was what? was held out. It only came in the 7th, 8th century. For all those years, it was totally what? Kept out. Just look at the four madhabs. Look at the people who attribute themselves to the four imams. I'm Hanafi, I'm Shafi'i, I'm Maliki, 
I'm humbly. Of course, there are people that are fanatical in all madhabs, people that are upon innovation and this and that in all madhabs, but the percentage of people that are humbly and that are upon some wild and crazy bid'ah is nothing like the people who say they're Hanafi or Maliki. Abedin. No comparison, let alone the amount of time. Things just started happening to the Hanbali Madhab. But for years, whenever they went to call someone that was upon the way of Athar or the way of the pious predecessors, they would say Hanbali. And that's because Imam Muhammad was so strict on Hadith and Sunnah. So that, his, his, his rigid adherence to, to the Sunnah, it prevented a lot of things from creeping into his madhab. Everybody understand this? So when we talk about usul, we talk about fiqh, we talk about qira'ah, the door is far more, huh? it's wider for all types of things to creep in than for hadith. So the hadith culture is always going to be what? Tighter and stricter. So their adab are going to be more finely tuned and more stringent. Wallahu alam. That's in brief. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina wa imamina Muhammad. Thank you very much. Inshallah tomorrow. Bidnillah.